1998, off Canada's east coast, a modern passenger jet run by one of the world's best airlines catches fire at 33,000 feet. In its final six minutes, communications from the cockpit cease. It's burning already! Then the plane plummets into the ocean. <laughs> 229 people are dead. What caused the fire is a mystery. Many of the vessels uh, reported to the Canadian Navy vessel standing by on scene they were finding bodies and making repeated requests uh, for more body bags and get the bodies Now, terrible. after one of the largest investigations in aviation history, the complete story behind the loss of Swiss Air Flight 111 can finally be told. It's a wake-up call for the entire airline industry to ensure that what happened aboard Swiss Air 111 would never happen again. This accident investigation was a unique opportunity to assess the materials in airplanes. And the problem is not only just the stuff that can burn, but the fact you can't see it. When you really have fire on board, the clock is running against you. September the 2nd, 1998. Swiss Air Flight 111 prepared to depart New York's JFK International Airport en route to Geneva, Switzerland. The aircraft was a McDonnell Douglas 11, or MD-11, a model first developed in 1986 as a highly automated, modern replacement for the antiquated DC-10. It was considered one of the most reliable passenger jets in the skies, and Swiss Air pilots were among the world's best trained. Okay, after start checklist. Um, engine anti-ice, not required. Roger, not required. Auto brakes, take off. Swiss Air 111's pilots were Captain Roger, Urs Zimmermann and First Officer five. Stefan Löw. Swiss Air 111, hold short, 3-1 left. Zimmerman encouraged an easy-going atmosphere in the cockpit, but he was also known for his by-the-book precision. When not flying, he was an instructor of new pilots for Switzerland's national airline. Take checklist. Uh, flaps and slats. Flaps set, 15 degrees. Set at 15. On board were 215 passengers, 12 crew, and two pilots. Most were French, American, or Swiss. 23-year-old Stephanie Shaw was on her way home to her parents in Geneva. Stephanie uh, was blessed in many ways. She was uh, physically very attractive. She was an intelligent girl. She, uh, the reason she went to New York was that she had been invited to become a member of the World Economic Forum, which is based in Geneva. And she wanted to have this trip uh, before she joined. She was a darling, she, an absolute darling. 8.18 PM. Swiss Air 111 Hemi, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff. Roger, Swiss Air 111. For safety, the Swiss Air pilots push the throttles forward together, ensuring no single pilot can botch a takeoff. The R, the E2. Swiss Air Flight 111 lifted off and made her way northeast toward the open Atlantic. For the first 15 minutes after takeoff, there was no communication from Swiss Air 111. It was an unusual, small detail that would later baffle investigators. Well, it does happen occasionally. They had not yet reached what we call the North Atlantic track system, where then you're not really usually in radio contact. So 
I thought it was a little abnormal, but it appears it was just nothing more than a mistake in radio frequency. When the guy dialed it in and swapped over the radio, he had put in the incorrect frequency and evidently uh, just, you know, they didn't make another attempt at contacting someone. It was strange. And uh, I agree with you. It was kind of, it's kind of like, whoa, that's, that's interesting. Atlantic air traffic is handled by a remote center in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. Almost half an hour after takeoff, Captain Zimmerman made his first communication with Moncton. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, good uh, evening, level 330. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, Moncton Center, good evening. Reports of uh, occasional light turbulence at all levels. Moncton, Swiss Air. It was a perfectly normal transatlantic crossing. In first class, Swiss Air passengers were among the first in the world to have a personalized in-flight entertainment network. Though now common, the system was an innovation in 1998. Passengers could choose their own movie, browse the internet, and gamble. They uh, evaluated the market and they thought that introducing a modern in-flight entertainment system combined with a gambling system so that passengers actually can use their credit card and gamble during long-range flights um, would make them more attractive. This luxury would be the source of controversy to come. Smell something? Yeah, what is that? Go have a look, I'll take the controls. Roger, you have control. First Officer Love investigated the area near the air condition event. Harmless smoke traces from air conditioning systems are common on commercial jets. see anything, Urs. And there's nothing up there now. You hail for me, Captain? Stefan and I were sure we smelled smoke a few seconds ago. Can you smell anything? I smell it too, yeah. Could you smell in the cabin before you came in? No, definitely not. They agreed that the air conditioner was the likely culprit. Can't see it or smell it anymore. Air conditioning, is it? Yeah. Please close it, thanks. Behind the sealed panel, the pilots could not see that the problem was getting worse. Less than 45 seconds after smoke disappeared in the cockpit of Swiss Air 111, it returned. Zimmerman followed Swiss Air procedure. Again. He made plans to divert to the nearest place to land. Find the closest place to land, Stefan. We'll need the nav charts from the library, uh, also weather data for the area. Boston's close. It's not doing well at all up there. Zimmerman radioed air traffic control in Moncton, New Brunswick. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, good evening. United 920 Heavy, Moncton Center, good evening. The controller dealt with another aircraft before responding to Swiss Air. Other aircraft calling, say again. Swiss Air 111 Heavy is declaring pan, pan, pan. We have smoke in the cockpit. Uh, request um, uh, immediate return to a convenient place, I guess. Boston. Pan, pan, pan is an international term used to notify air traffic control of an urgent situation. 
one step below declaring May Day. You say to Boston you want to go? Uh, I guess Boston, uh, we need for some weather there. Uh, we are starting right turn here, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. Swiss Air 111, roger, and... Descent to flight level 310. 310. 310, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. This is the first interview with one of the air traffic controllers in Moncton. My name is Bill Pickerel, and on September 1998, September 2nd, 1998, I was one of two Halifax terminal controllers uh, working the evening shift. The pan uh, in any kind of a special uh, condition is usually dealt with uh, as an emergency, and this, in fact, was dealt with that way. The aircraft was immediately given priority, and the uh, high-level supervisor initiated a call to the Rescue Coordination Center. Pickerel's colleague determined that Swiss Air 111 was just 66 nautical miles from Halifax and 300 from Boston. But Captain Zimmerman had chosen an airport he knew. A lot of times when you're having a problem, you would rather be dealing with an issue where you're much more familiar with the airport because that relieves a little stress on you. This is an initial problem. He's sitting there, he's looking up there, and he's trying to think, well, I've got smoke here. Now, what does it mean? Let's see, where, where are we? where's the closest place I can go to that I can talk to a Swiss air mechanic? Boston. Swiss Air 111 Center. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, go ahead. Would you prefer to go into Halifax? Or is we better put the mask on? Uh, stand by. Realizing their location, Zimmerman decided Halifax was now the best option. Affirmative, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. We prefer Halifax from our position. Swiss Air 111 Roger, proceed direct to Halifax. Descend now to flight level 290. Level 290 to Halifax, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. A British Airways pilot in the area offered the crew what little help he could. Swiss Air 111 Heavy from Speedbird 214. I can give you the Halifax weather if you like. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, uh, we have the uh, oxygen masks on. Uh, go ahead with the weather. It's the 300 Zulu weather. Was Swiss Air 111 commenced its descent to below 30,000 feet. The pilots calm and in control. It would take about 20 minutes to reach Halifax. Over. Roger, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, we copy 2980. Swiss Air 111, you're cleared to 10,000 feet, and the Halifax altimeter is 2980. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, 2980 at 10,000 feet. And Swiss Air 111, can you tell me what your fuel on board is? Uh, stand by for this. Speedbird 1506 is a Tusky listing out. Speedbird 1506, roger. The controller signed off with another aircraft. His jurisdiction was high altitude flights. As Swiss Air was on descent to Halifax, he hands over responsibility to Bill Pickrell. At that point, uh, everything was normal. Uh, I, I gave the pilot an initial descent, and uh, he requested to level off at an intermediate altitude to get the cabin in order for the landing, which I took to mean that they needed to pack away dinner trays and uh, things like that. It was an indication to me that uh, uh, while his situation was unusual, uh, that uh, they weren't considering it as uh, an emergency at that time. Watch your speed, Stefan. Don't descend too fast. Roger. Here, have the uh, cabin crew prepare for landing. We'll be setting down in Halifax in about 20 minutes. I'm about to start the checklist here. Yes, Captain Zimmerman. Zimmerman had two checklists for smoke in the cockpit. To complete both would take 20 minutes. This was Swiss Air Company policy. In the meantime, Love continued the descent into Halifax. Stefan, I'll need you to handle the radio while I do this checklist. All right. 119er, point two for the Swiss Air 111 Heavy. Roger, 
Swiss Air 111 was now at about 25,000 feet. Pickerel advises them to descend to 3,000. But First Officer Love said he'd rather fly at 8,000 until the passenger cabin was cleared. Their attitude underscored the sense of control in the cockpit. From my point of view, it uh, gave all initial appearances that it should be a fairly straightforward operation, that uh, assuming that uh, everything happened normally, the aircraft uh, would require a minimum of handling to uh, uh, lead them into Halifax. Swiss Air 111, you can uh, descend to three, level off at an intermediate altitude if you wish, just advise. But Pickerel was concerned the plane was not coming down fast enough. It appeared that the aircraft uh, might have been a little bit high, and uh, I wanted to ensure that the pilots were aware of how uh, far they were from the airport, how many miles they had to fly, so that they could uh, judge their own descent and make their decision about what they wanted to do. Roger, at the time we descend to 8,000 feet, and we are clear at any time to 3,000 feet. I keep you advised. Okay, can I vector you uh, to set up for runway 06 at Halifax? Uh, Roger, Vector for 6 will be fine. Swiss Air 111, heavy. Swiss Air 111, Roger, turn left, heading of uh, 030. Left, heading 030 for the Swiss Air 111, heavy. Captain Zimmerman needed information for the unfamiliar airfield but his flight bag was out of reach. He summoned the flight attendant to help. You held me, Captain. For two minutes now. I need that flight bag there. It's got the approach charts for Halifax. <clears throat> okay, get back to your crew. Yes, Captain. The chief flight attendant notified passengers that the flight was being diverted. There was no panic. The plane was flying normally, and there was no sign of smoke in the cabin. Swiss Air 111, the localizer frequency is 109 or decimal niner. You've got 30 miles to fly to the threshold. Uh, we're going to need more than 30 miles. But still at more than 20,000 feet, Swiss Air 111 was too high to make a landing in just 30 miles. The frequency is a 109er decimal niner for the localizer. Okay, Roger, 109er point niner. And uh, we are turning left, heading uh, north, Swiss Air 111 heavy. And we've got to dump fuel. Agreed. So far, communications from Swiss Air had been calm. Still, Moncton Center initiated emergency efforts at Halifax Airport. Preparing ground crews for an emergency, Pickerel sought information from the pilots. souls on board and your fuel on board, please, for emergency services. Roger. At this time, fuel on board is two, three, zero tons. We have to dump some fuel. May we do that in this area during descent? Pickerel was surprised to learn so late that Swiss Air 111 needed to dump fuel. At that point, it became more of a complicated situation. In fact, with every transmission after that, it became more and more complicated. Pickerel considered his options for a safe place that wouldn't take the aircraft too far from Halifax. He decided to direct the plane over St. Margaret's Bay, about 30 miles from the airport. The other choice, uh, if he had said he needed to stay close, was to uh, start the aircraft in a, a, a right-hand turn to uh, set him up for any of the other runways. I had to keep him flying in a, in a circle or a constant track so that he wouldn't fly back into his own fuel, which would have been uh, not good. Dumping fuel is standard procedure. A fully fueled passenger jet is too heavy and could break up on landing. Are you able to take but co-pilot Love wondered if, given their situation, 
they might forgo the regulations. They want us to turn to the south. Should we just forget about dumping and just land? No, dump it. Okay, we are able for a left or right turn to the south in order to dump. I initiated the vector back toward St. Margaret's Bay to start him in that direction. It indicated to me that, again, uh, it wasn't uh, a critical situation on board, that, in fact, he did have time to be able to go back and uh, dump his fuel over the water. Swiss Air 111, uh, Roger. Turn left, heading of uh, 200 degrees, and advise me when you're ready to dump. It will be about 10 miles before you're off the coast. You will still be within about 25 miles of the airport. Roger, we are turning left, 200. In that case, we are going to descend to only 10,000 feet in order to dump the fuel. Roger, maintain 10,000. I'll advise you when you're over the water. It will be very shortly. Roger. While Zimmerman continued with his checklist, Love accidentally transmitted to Bill Pickrell in Moncton. Are you in the emergency checklist for air conditioning smoke? Yes. Uh, Swiss Air 111, say again, please. Uh, sorry, that was not for you. Swiss Air 111 was asking internally. OK. Air speed is decreasing below 306. Level off speed here. Let's fly the plane as you see that stuff on. Swiss Air 111, continue left heading 180. You'll be off the coast in about 15 miles. Left heading 180, roger. Swiss Air 111 and maintaining at 10,000 feet. Roger. Cabin bus off. Cabin bus off, Roger. The cabin bus switch knocked out all the lighting in the cabin. It was an indication for the passengers that something was wrong, but hardly alarming. Ladies and gentlemen, we have temporarily lost the lights in the cabin. Please remain calm. The crew will be coming around with flashlights to assist in landing. Despite a cockpit filled with smoke, there was still no trace in the passenger cabin. <laughs> you will be staying within about uh, 35, 40 miles of the airport if you have to get back to the airport in a hurry. OK, that's fine with us. Please tell us when we can start to dump the fuel. Suddenly, the aircraft sent out a warning that the smoke was a sign of a more serious problem. Autopilot disconnect. Copy that. Autopilot disconnect. Swiss Air 111. The autopilot disconnected because the plane's computers sensed erratic readings. In the next 90 seconds, those readings went haywire. 11,000 and 9,000 feet. Swiss Air 111, you can block between 5,000 and 12,000 if you wish. One by one, the instruments failed. The calm in the cockpit dissolved. Copy that. We are clear between 12 and 5,000 feet. We are declaring emergency now, Swiss Air 111, at time 0124. Then the two pilots spoke simultaneously. Combined with other distractions in the control room, Pickerel was unable to hear a critical transmission. Love's declaration that they must land immediately. We are dumping fuel now. We must land immediate. Swiss Air 111, just a couple more miles. I'll be right with you. Roger that. And we're declaring emergency now. Swiss Air 111. Missing this transmission is a moment Bill Pickrell relives today. I'm not sure that it's a feeling that you can adequately describe. I recall reviewing the events of that night a thousand times to determine if there was something additionally that I could have done or if there was uh, some mistake that I might have made or was there any way that I contributed to this. And eventually I was able to come to the point of realization that there wasn't anything that I could have done, uh, that everything that could have was done. Now there was nothing to do but wait. Thirty seconds after declaring an emergency, the pilots of Swiss Air 111 faced an inferno. All my screens are down. I'm flying on standby instruments, maintaining 300. Swiss Air 111, you are cleared to commence your fuel dump on that track. And advise me when your dump is complete. 
Soon after I gave him authorization to commence the fuel dump, um, there was no acknowledgement. Um, initially, I wasn't concerned by that because I considered that he was probably doing the fuel dump, he was reviewing a checklist, he was busy doing things, and as per our training, we're told not to bother the pilots in those kinds of situations. Swiss Air 111, check. You are cleared to start the fuel dump. There was no further communication from the aircraft. Six minutes later, residents of Peggy's Cove heard a devastating explosion. No one knew what had happened to 229 people after six minutes of silence. It was probably one of the most helpless feelings that any individual can have, not being able to do anything but just sit and watch the target and hope that it would turn back toward the airport. And of course it didn't. The following morning, would-be rescuers glimpsed the terrible remains of Swiss Air 111. Only one body was discovered intact. In Geneva, Ian Shaw had a premonition about his 23-year-old daughter, Stephanie. That night, the night on which she was due to return, for reasons I can't explain even now, I was restless and I was disturbed, and um, I uh, slept early and woke uh, while my wife was still awake and asked her if she had had news of Stephanie. No, she had not, but she didn't expect to have news of Stephanie. We knew she was coming on that flight and that she would certainly expect me to be at the airport to fetch her in the morning. I awoke uh, around 6 Geneva time and on television there was a report of the crash of Swiss Air 111. And I knew instantaneously that we had lost our daughter. Air traffic controller Bill Pickrell was in shock. It's a strange experience. Um, I'm not sure that I can adequately express the feelings, but it's... Um, you work to, to provide a service and you, uh, you read about aircraft flying into a mountain or ending up in a swamp in some distant country, but you never expect that it's going to happen in your backyard. And when it does, it's... Uh, Kind of a lonely experience, I guess, in one sense. The Transportation Safety Board of Canada launched what would become the largest disaster investigation in the nation's history. They only knew Swiss Air 111 experienced a cockpit fire, but what caused it remained a mystery. Well, this accident was a challenging one to investigate in that initially, of course, we had to recover the aircraft from about 55 meters of water, around 185 feet. Of course, it was also in many pieces. Uh, as it turns out, it was in a couple of million pieces. So that was the initial challenge. And then after that, of course, uh, when you have so many pieces, you need to de determine which are the relevant ones and what are these pieces telling you about what happened and why. The 
TSB embarked on a five-stage plan. First, divers were deployed to survey the wreckage. They discovered that the plane was smashed into millions of pieces. But as the autumn weather worsened, the risks to divers increased. At this rate, the salvage would take years to complete. Stage two. With help from the United States Navy, remote operated vehicles began a more detailed search. The ROVs helped investigators survey the site. But the question remained, how to recover tiny pieces of twisted metal from the bottom of the sea? We have to go through little bits of airplanes, little pieces. In Swiss Air, we've had about two million pieces of airplane, and we pretty much almost had to look at them all because we had to discredit certain things, terrorists, uh, bombs, various other types of faults. The TSB's investigators finally got the breakthrough they've been seeking, the black boxes. Recordings of cockpit and computer data told investigators that everything on the plane was working perfectly until the last few minutes. When the crew declared the pan, 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 that they had smoke in the cockpit, after going through all of these parameters, uh, we found no anomalies or no problems in any of that flight data that suggested there was a problem with the aircraft. So this led us to believe that the crew had a relatively operational aircraft. Aside from the, the smoke in the cockpit that they noted, uh, everything else appeared to be working fine. And uh, as they were making their plan to, uh, to send the aircraft, they experienced a series of systems failures that were in rapid succession and exponential. Copy that, autopilot disconnect. Swiss Air 111, we must fly manually now. Mike Poole's CVR team then faced a serious setback. The last six minutes on both flight recorders were missing. You're losing systems rapidly on the airplane in that 90-second period that things are happening very fast. And the last thing we, one of the last things we know about was the two recorders went offline. So the fire has uh, presumably breached the lines, breached the, uh, breached the sources to these recorders and has stopped them. With the failure of the black boxes, investigators were no closer to learning how or where the fire started on Swiss Air 111. Stage three, barges were deployed to scour the seabed for evidence. One by one, sad remnants of the airplane reached the surface. Her engines were recovered. Then the landing gear. These were among the largest pieces of Swiss Air 111 to be recovered. The rest were mere fragments, dredged up in a painfully slow process. Stage four, a nearby military hangar provided a makeshift lab for the growing team of forensic investigators. Representatives from the American NTSB, Boeing, Swiss Air, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police joined in the search for answers. Pieces of Swiss Air 111 arrived by the truckload, organized into various categories for analysis. Soon the hangar was stacked to capacity with the biggest jigsaw puzzle in aviation history. All the investigators knew for sure was that an initially small cockpit fire suddenly turned to catastrophe. The team sorted through nearly 155 miles of wiring retrieved from the wreckage of Swiss Air 111. Here, the first real clue, evidence of electrical arcing. Scorch marks on metal reveal that the source of the fire was in the back of the cockpit, directly behind the first officer. By examining the aircraft's wiring plans, investigators found a likely suspect, 
the entertainment system in first class. The system had some major deficiencies. It was getting very hot. It drew a lot of power. And uh, thereby, for example, raising the cabin, uh, cabin temperature uh, considerably, because it was always running. They did not install a simple off switch, nor did they install appropriate cooling systems to cool the system down. The TSB's investigators finally thought they had the breakthrough they'd been seeking. Our report indicates that there was a design flaw in the way the in-flight entertainment network installed in the first class and business class uh, sections of the aircraft were installed, uh, integrated into the electrical system of the airplane. When Captain Zimmerman threw the cabin bus switch, all power to the cabin should have been switched off. But the entertainment system remained on, overheating. If you had asked most pilots, they would say, well, if I push the cabin butt switch, it's going to turn off the things behind the cockpit. It's going to isolate that electrically for me so that I don't have to worry about that and that I can just concentrate on those things that might affect me flying the airplane. Well, as it turns out, that this switch was kind of bypassed in, in this case for this IFN or, or entertainment system. Swiss Air immediately disabled the entertainment systems on the rest of its fleet and the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board ordered an inspection of cockpit wiring on all MD-11s. Unfortunately, this simple solution proved insufficient. By the time that cabin switch was turned off, the fire was well underway, and uh, so that had no real um, bearing on the, the initiation or propagation of the fire in the Swiss Air 111 aircraft. But investigators determined that the problem with the entertainment system alone could not have brought down Swiss Air 111. The search for answers continued. Stage five. Undaunted, the TSB reconstructed the MD-11 from the wreckage. A wireframe mock-up they called the jig provided a spine for placing tiny pieces back where they once belonged. The reconstruction revealed that the fire spread with alarming speed from the cockpit back into the first-class galleys. Some metal showed heat damage from temperatures as high as 600 degrees centigrade. As the investigation continued, some argued that the actions of the pilots may have contributed to the disaster. Some experts charge that Zimmerman and Love's by the book approach may have cost them their lives. Was asking internally. Some operators emphasized in a very early stage, land as soon as possible, and then if you have time, go into the checklist. Others uh, said, here's the checklist, and at the end of the checklist, if that doesn't help, then land as soon as possible. Pretty contradictory to basic flying instructions where Student pilots uh, learned at a very early stage that whenever you have smoke, you have a fire, and fire means land as soon as possible. Emergency light switch on. Emergency light switch on. Unfortunately, in this case, the way the checklist was written, it didn't identify that now start towards the divert. It started more on, let's try to see if we can solve the problem. And. Uh, so now, all of a sudden, you're taking on a problem that just kind of crept up on you. You weren't expecting it. Uh, we're going to need more than 30 miles. But the TSB considered the timeline. Investigators determined that Swiss Air 111 would not have made Halifax Airport under any circumstances. There just wasn't enough time. In our calculation, uh, we uh, showed that starting at the ideal descent point from 33,000 feet, uh, which was uh, at about 10:14 uh, p.m. that night. It would take some 13 minutes to get the airplane onto the ground, which would take us to 10:27 p.m. By 10:24, the systems in the aircraft were starting to deteriorate. So we believe that under these circumstances, 
uh, the crew would not have been able to successfully land the airplane under those conditions with the amount of time that they had. Whatever caused the fire on Swiss Air, it happened at a lethal speed. The mystery remained. A year passed, then another ambitious operation began. The TSB hired a sophisticated Dutch salvage ship, Queen of the Netherlands. The vessel has a gigantic vacuum system, capable of dredging even the tiniest pieces of Swiss Air 111 from the ocean floor. A mixture of seawater, silt and aircraft were pumped into the ship's hold. This cargo was then pumped into a specially constructed reservoir on shore. When the water drained away, investigators found another million pieces of the aircraft. Any one of them may have held the clue to what caused the catastrophic fire. The painstaking sorting once again resumed. Finally, after 15 months, they found what they'd been seeking, a single faulty wire. We looked at all of the possible sources of uh, heat that might start a fire in that area. And in this instance, um, we did uh, discover a wire that uh, arced in that way. And right next to it was some very flammable material called uh, metallized polyethylene terephthalate covering material that uh, covers the insulation blankets. This polyethylene insulate, which lined the MD-11, is common on commercial airlines worldwide. It has passed the industry's flammability tests that require materials to self-extinguish after a reasonable period of time. The investigation now took an abrupt turn. Instead of seeking the cause of the fire, the TSB now focused on the flammable materials that fueled it. This thermoacoustical material that was in this aircraft was very flammable, even though it passed a test. It does sustain and it does propagate flame. So this investigation did focus on the flammability of materials and the requirement to reassess the criteria that is used to certify materials, not just thermal acoustical insulation blanket material, but also other materials that goes into aircraft, much of it in hidden areas. Investigators now had their answer. A wire arced in a closed space behind the cockpit. The arc ignited the insulation, which in turn lit other materials, such as foams and plastics. The pilots could not sense how quickly the fire intensified. But 14 minutes after they declared pan, 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 the fire disabled all electronics in the cockpit. The black boxes went dead. A forensic examination also shed light on the desperate final minutes in the cockpit. Love was in his seat. Captain Zimmerman was not, likely fighting the fire and probably dead before impact. The uh, first officer was probably trying to find a place where he could put this big airplane. Um, he just didn't have a lot going for him. He didn't have a lot of instrumentation left. And I'm sure he was looking for something, some indication that would give him an idea of where he could put the airplane down, maybe even ditch the airplane. What is known is that the first officer was in his seat, whether he was uh, unconscious, conscious, maybe had severe degree burns on his skin. It's not known. We know the captain was not in his seat, so very likely he was trying to fight the fire. That the checklists were found uh, molten together, the pages, indicates that they were used to fight a fire. At 10.30 Halifax time, Love shut down engine two. 
Investigators determined that he probably received a warning the engine was on fire. Chillingly, it proved that Love was alive a minute before impact. They could not determine whether the passengers were aware of the fire, at least until the very final moments. There were traces found of soot and smoke extending as much far to the business class overhead area. Whether the passengers have smelled the smoke, it's not known. Uh, DNA analysis showed that they had no residue in their body. The aircraft hit the water with a force of 350 Gs. The TSB spent four and a half years and 40 million US dollars analyzing the wreckage of Swiss Air 111 the largest air disaster investigation in Canada's history. Their conclusion, flammable materials do not belong on commercial aircraft. The rate of progression in this airplane, I think, surprised us and surprised uh, others. Uh, and uh, that's why we emphasize, again, the importance of um, raising the bar on the flammability standards for materials used in airplanes. Ian Shaw waited four years for the report to reveal the fatal flaw that took the life of his daughter. The truth has not diminished his anger at Swiss Air. There has to be accountability. If you are involved in wrongdoing, you must be held accountable. And you must declare your sense of respons responsibility. Otherwise, you are hiding and you are hiding, in this case, behind the flag of Switzerland. I think it's unbelievable. In the aftermath, Swiss Air decided to remove the flammable insulate from its entire fleet. They also made changes to checklist procedure, reducing response time in a cockpit smoke emergency. Swiss Air did something very interesting. They modified their entire Swiss Air MD-11 fleet. According to all these findings, they built in cameras and smoke detectors, even in into hidden areas where pilots have a little TV monitor and they can see whenever there is a smoke warning, which makes them all help gain time. And that's the most important when you have the case of, when you have a fire. But plagued with financial problems, the mighty Swiss Air shocked the industry when it declared bankruptcy in October 2001. The flammable insulation that set Swiss Air ablaze remains in two-thirds of commercial airplanes today, but not for very much longer. The metallized polyethylene terephthalate material has been essentially banned from aircraft, and the criteria to certify that kind of material for use in airplanes has been worked on. It has not been put into law as yet, but uh, we look forward to that being done, so the criteria is more stringent. The US Federal Aviation Administration has given a deadline of 2005 to remove the material from all commercial aircraft. This major overhaul is designed to ensure that what took place on Swiss Air 111 will never happen again. The industry is trying to remove it, but it's, I don't think they're removing it um, as quickly necessary as they could. There's always that battle. How expensive is it to do something that's replacement, or are you going to replace it in an airplane you're going to throw away in another couple of years? We have to live within certain economic realities. For Ian Shaw, losing his daughter so suddenly and violently has left a permanent emotional scar. He left his wife and his wealth behind in Geneva and now runs a modest restaurant in Nova Scotia in view of the sea where his daughter died. Why would I come here to this particular point in Nova Scotia? A lot of people have said, oh yes, we fully understand you want to be close to your daughter and, and um, the point where the plane crashed. That is no part of my 
being here. Swiss Air um, ripped out of me any possibility of proximity to my daughter. I found a comfort in the awareness of the presence of the eternal ocean, the ocean which has been going backwards and forwards for many, many, many thousands, millions of years. I came here because I had to. Um, I, I can't give a fully rational declaration to you of why I came here. I can only say to you, I am in the right place for the wrong reasons. <laughs>